Hello, this is Michael Baerberger from Sports Illustrated. Welcome to another edition of In Conversation With. We're here today with a friend and the director of the USJ, Mike Davis. Mike, pleasure as always to see great you. Great to be with you, Michael. Great to talk golf with you. One of the great golf conversations of all time right here, Mike, Mike Davis. Mike, the US Open is going to, two US Opens are going to Pinehurst this year, the men followed by the ladies. How did this idea even come about to have two consecutive U.S. Opens at Pinehurst? Well, it, it was really my predecessor, David Fay, who, who, by the way, decided to retire. Uh, maybe it was because of this back-to-back -back Open. But no, David came up with the idea because he had gone to U.S. Open tennis and said, this is such a great gathering of the world's best men and women. How can we do this for the U.S. Open Women's Open? And we had done that at the Boys and Girls Juniors before. Um, but, but to do it for the U.S. Open and the Women's Open with the size of that is quite a different thing. So we talked about it, and I can remember like it was yesterday, him coming into my office. And first of all, I said, you know, have you lost your mind? Um, but, and, and mostly because um, I couldn't figure out how we could set a golf course up the right way for both the men and the women. Because if you, if you go to an Oakmont, a Shinnecock, the Olympic Club, or one of these treasured venues we have, um, the length of the rough, for example, for, for the men has to be longer than, than for the women to get, you know, relatively the same type of penalty that we're looking for for a national open. Um, but the thing that was neat about Pinehurst and the reason that uh, ultimately we focused on that is, number one, um, it had, at the time, Bermuda rough. So Bermuda rough, to go from what we needed for the men, which was about three inches, to what we needed for the women, which was about two and a half inches, we said, we can make that work versus if you're at Oakmont, you know, you're going from four, four and a half inches down to two and a half, three, and it's just too much. The plant, you know, the grass blade just simply won't take that much. So that's really uh, how it got started. And, you know, th this, it should be, at least in theory, a, a great celebration. Two weeks of our, you know, two most important national championships that we conduct. And it will be a great celebration, really, uh, of what's best in men's golf and women's golf. So I, I think we're, we're excited. There, are there some risk? Absolutely. But there's so much upside to mm -hmm. this that uh, we said, let's, let's try it. So we'll see how it goes. Great. Well, one of the risks, I guess, would be what would happen if there was a Monday playoff. What, what, what time would you start a, uh, a Monday playoff? Well, we always, uh, with, with the 18-hole playoff for the men, it's, it's generally speaking, always noon when we're in the East Coast. So that's when we'd start this. And mm -hmm. the idea is we really are trying to integrate these two weeks together mm -hmm. to the extent we can. So the idea would be Monday morning, if we do have that playoff, we're going to send a fair number of the women out and let them practice. And then we'll give ourselves a little bit of leeway to where, you know, if they're going to start at noon, we'll probably make sure that by 11 a.m. there are no players on the first hole so we can go ahead and roll the green again, tidy up the bunkers, and just make sure that it's presentable for a playoff. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that's the idea. And, and, you know, think about it this way. If the women are out practicing and you're having this playoff go on, I mean, it's great for the spectators there. But, but think about it from a broadcasting standpoint. When you're watching two or maybe three players play, there's always that time, you know, from when they hit their tee shots down to the drive mm -hmm. zones. Now you can go, you know, show some of the women practicing. Uh -huh. So it really, I think, is, can be an exciting thing, and it's, it's unique. I, I think that one of the things that the world's going to be amazed at is how good the women truly are. Yeah. And, that, and that's, you know, looking back to setting up quite a few women's opens, as, lo, as well as um, the US Open, that's the thing early on that struck me is how good the women are, and they just don't seem to get enough credit for how good they are. Yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, years ago, I was covering a, a, a women's event, and uh, Annika was out about 138 yards, and she had her playing partner, Mark. And then I said, wow, after the round, I said, Annika, I've never seen them before. I've never seen someone uh, request the playing partner mark when they were 138 yards out. And she said, you should watch me play golf more. <laughs> I remember in 2006, um, she uh, won the Open. That was the last Open that she won. It was up at Newport Country Club, and mm -hmm. she played in a playoff. Uh, and back then, it was an 18-hole playoff. And I remember to this day, um, and I've walked with a lot of players and officiated I'm not so sure that wasn't the most impressive round of golf, men, male or female, that I've ever seen. I mean, mm -hmm. she just didn't miss a shot. Yeah. And it was just a joy to watch. The women play for quite a bit less money uh, than mm -hmm. the men do. Um, uh, why is that the case, and, and do you see that ever changing? 
Well, it, it's a great question. And, and I will tell you, the, the long-term philosophy that the USG's had with purses is that we really want to pay a competitive purse for the three professional events, or at least the three championships that professionals can play in. And um, when we look at that, you know, we look at what kind of the marketplace is right now and saying, well, okay, on the men's professional tours, what are they playing for? You look at the revenues coming in for the event. And ideally, I mean, Michael, for our purse, purses, if we get it right, the purses are high enough so the players playing are satisfied, but but we don't make them too high because at the end of the day, we are a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So every dollar in theory that goes into a purse is a dollar that we can't use for junior golf, we can't use for turf grass research, or, or whatever initiative we're involved with. Mm -hmm. And you know, over the years, we've been pretty good at that. So is there a difference between the men and the women? Absolutely there is, but you, you look at the economies or the economics of those two events and they're just mm -hmm. different. One of the strategies uh, that we're focused on is, is growing women's golf. We're focused on making the women's open even more important right now. Mm -hmm. And we don't think we necessarily do that with a purse, but there are other ways. So you're gonna see us in the coming years even have more focused on this, on the women's open and, and doing things because ultimately these championships, listen, there's only 156 players there for the men and 156 women and, and a lot more try to qualify, but we know the impact these championships have. I mean, it had it on me when I was a youngster that one of the reasons I was, you know, uh, inspired to play golf was that my father took me at a very young age to the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. and Which that, one was that? Well, that was the U.S. Open at Baldesrol mm -hmm. uh, that Nicholas won, and I was, uh, I think I was 16 years old at the time. That absolutely had an impact. I remember going to the 1975 Ryder Cup with my grandfather at Laurel mm -hmm. Valley. That had an impact. So um, the more we can do to promote the Women's Open, the U.S. Open, or our amateur championships, we really think that's a good thing for the game of golf. How do you think this course sets up for, for Phil, Phil Mickelson? Well, in theory, it should set up really well. I mean, ultimately, you know, how a player does at U.S. Open week, uh, in, in so many ways, just it depends on whether their, their game's on that week mm -hmm. or not. But there's no doubt there's certain courses for certain horses. And when I look at Pinehurst number two, I think uh, this is one of those courses that a long high ball hitter who's a good putter uh, will really have an advantage. And, and add to that, they have to be very good at course management. Mm -hmm. Pioneer's number two, you know, it, it dangles that carrot a lot. Um, there may be a whole location over on the side where it's just screaming out, hit it towards me. But uh -huh. if you know Pioneer's number two, uh -huh. the last thing you wanna do is short side yourself. Uh -huh. So there are times, I mean, and, and this hasn't changed. You hear Jack Nicholas's philosophy on when he played Pioneer's number two. He'd say, I just hit it for the middle of the green and mm -hmm. putt to the whole location. Mm -hmm. But the players are so good that it, it's not, in some cases, it's not in their DNA to play away from a flagstick. Yeah. So, so ultimately, um, back to your question of Phil Mickelson, to me, this is a wider course that requires a higher ball flight and good putting. That's Phil Mickelson. The uh, USJ has had a great and long run with, uh, with NBC. This will be uh, mm -hmm. NBC's uh, uh, final U.S. Open, or at least uh, in this current contract. Uh, what are some of your uh, fondest memories of uh, working with NBC, and what do you consider some of their uh, finest telecasts? Well, Michael, I can remember in 1994, that was the last year we were with ABC, and uh, had a lot of good friends with that group, and then uh, NBC took over in, two, excuse me, in 1995. And the innovations that, uh, you know, their executive producers, Tommy Roy, that, that over the last 20 years that he has instilled have been remarkable. I mean, it is just such a talented, dedicated group. And, and I would also be remiss if I didn't mention ESPN. We've had a relationship with them domestically for 32 years. And, you know, those two networks, um, they, they have done such a great job. And they've taken us to a level that we've simply never been. And, Again, you get back to what's that do. It, it's more than just a championship. I mean, it, it does impact the game. So, um, you know, from the producers, the directors, to the talent, um, 
Uh, they will be sorely missed. Uh, we're excited about the new relationship with Fox. Um, you know, this certainly is going to bring more monies to the USGA. And, and for those that, you know, are somewhat cynical about that, I, I think that uh, you have to remember that at the end of the day, we are a nonprofit, and those monies will ultimately go back into the game. And, and we spent, I mean, literally, you look at the last 12, 13 years, what people don't realize is that, you know, conservatively, we've been basically put a billion dollars back into the game mm -hmm. on different things we do. I mean, the, the governance function we're involved with or the research things for the game and best practices on golf course maintenance or handicapping or running championships, those things cost a lot of money. So mm -hmm. we're excited because it ultimately will allow us to do even more things. But at the same time, uh, a lot of us, me included, are going to be, it'll be a sad year because we've had so many friends with NBC and ESPN. Uh, so many people uh, younger than, than ourselves were really introduced to the game, uh, probably by Johnny Miller uh, working U.S. Opens. Uh, what do you think Johnny Miller has, uh, has meant to the USJ and U.S. Open golf in particular? Well, listen, Johnny Miller has been on air and literally had tears coming out of his eyes talking about the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. it, it, to that day, mm -hmm. to this day, it, it's the most important championship for him. You know, for me personally, you know, really starting golf in the mid-1970s, that's the guy I looked at. Mm -hmm. He inspired me. Um, I, you know, I saw him play quite a few times back in the 1970s. And um, so, and I, you know, when I... When I really got to know him back in the mid-1990s with, with the NBC, mm -hmm. um, that was a special moment for me personally because I, I had always looked up to him. And so, you know, one of the things, Johnny, he, he, he speaks his mind. Um, and, but when it comes to the U.S. Open, he gets so excited about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember, for instance, a couple years ago at the Olympic Club, which is the golf course that Johnny grew up on. Mm -hmm. And he played in the U.S. Open as an amateur there. Uh, he and I went around the course and talked about it. Michael, he was like a kid in a candy store. Mm -hmm. He was so excited about, you know, I remember when it was like this, and this is so neat you're doing that. And um, so, you know, it, it'll, again, it, it just, like the other people with NBC and ESPN, um, you know, uh, Johnny will be sorely missed. Um, he's so passionate about it. Johnny can be a very uh, literal person. And uh, years ago, your predecessor, David Fay told me the following story, and I can use the word I'm about to use because in this context, it's not profane. But uh, Johnny's on the air in the US Opens at Shinnecock. This is in 95. They do a panoramic view and they're showing uh, National Golf Links and uh, Maidstone and some of the other uh, courses out there. And, uh, and John says, uh, well, the thing about these courses out here on the east end of Long Island, you got a lot of ball busters. And, <laughs> and David's like, but of course, he meant it literally like, these courses are so hard, and you're playing in the wind, they will bust your ball. Yeah. Nothing profane about it, but that's just how John... Yeah, he's just that's he's how such John an honest golf. kind of guy, yeah. too, that, that whatever is thinking comes out with Johnny. Yes. He, there, there's not, as they like to say, there's not a filter with him, which, listen, it has made him one of the great golf analysts that, that we've seen, just because he, he knows... The thing about him, too, I oftentimes, when I'm watching Johnny Miller, I say... How did he even notice that? I mean, uh -huh. what, what, you know, what, what makes his mind tick? But he's just, he's that, um, you know, astute and that uh, mindful of the little intricacies that make, uh, that make our he game really special. He really is a savant. And the only person I could say that, that I would say is even more of a savant than, than Johnny Miller, would, and who he was on TV briefly, and, and he would be great, is Lee Trevino. Oh, to hear Lee absolutely. Trevino talk uh, golf and U.S. Open golf uh, in particular. Okay, Mike, last thing for you. Do you know the word association game? A little bit. Okay, the word association <laughs> game is I'm going to give you a name. Okay. And you give me the first thing that pops in your head. But as you think about the name, answer in the context of U.S. Open play. You all right? You ready? Okay. Arnold Palmer. Courageous. Uh, you know, it does not have to be a single word, by the way. <laughs> but he is courageous. What, what comes to mind on courageous? Well, I mean, let's look at how Arnold played. Arnold was the kind of player that would, would, would there, there wasn't a flag stick that Arnold Palmer wouldn't go for. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, look at the 1960 Open, one of the great U.S. Opens of all time, and that fourth round where he, uh, he, he was a little aspired, inspired by one of uh, Bob Drum, a, a media member who, who basically told him he was done, and he get, proceeds to get up on that famous first hole at Cherry Hills and drives the green, and then off he goes, and and uh, you know, beats Ben Hogan, beats a young amateur named Jack Nicholas, and it was truly one of the 
Great yes. opens ever. Mickey Wright. Perhaps the best swing ever. That's what Hogan thought. Best swing ever, man or woman, is what Hogan once mm -hmm. said. Hale Irwin. Consummate U.S. Open player. He really was. He was, he was the prototype of fairways mm -hmm. and greens. So when you're talking about Nicholas saying just hit in the middle right. of the green to Pinehurst, this guy hit in the middle of the green. Uh, Mike Donald. Georgia Southern graduate. Uh, uh, no, M Mike uh, was in that uh, 1990 U.S. Open at Medina against Hale Irwin in that playoff, and uh, it was just marvelous to watch. And uh, uh, so almost, almost a U.S. Open champ. Uh -huh. Uh, Tiger Woods. Brilliant on virtually any U.S. Open golf course. He could play them all. And that, that, that saying, different courses for different horses, Tiger's an exception to that. He, 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 when, when his game's on, he could win at any U.S. Open. How would you compare, here's two great U.S. Open players, who you, and you saw both of them a lot. Um, in terms of uh, thinking their way around a U.S. Open course, how would you compare Jack and Tiger? I would consider very similar, which is why, um, you know, Jack Nicklaus really is the greatest U.S. Open player of all time. Um, and, you know, Tiger still got quite a few U.S. Opens to go, but I think they played very much the same way. I mean, they, they, they struck the ball differently and they each had certain areas of their game that were better. But I think that's why they're both so great is that they, they got it when it come to, came to a U.S. Open. You, would, you never saw Jack Nicklaus or Tiger Woods compl complain about a U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you know, Nicklaus has said it. When other players are complaining, he liked that because he kind of figured, okay, check them off. They're not going to win. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that leads us to the next name, and maybe you can explain why, why it does. Sandy Tatum. Oh. S Sandy... Uh, Sandy is a living legend. Sandy had so much to do with uh, how we set up a U.S. Open today and, and, and arguably one of the greatest USJ presidents we've ever had. And do you remember Sandy's famous line from the uh, U.S. Open at Wingfoot? Oh, sure. Yeah, we're not, uh, we're not trying to embarrass the, embarrass the players. We're trying to, uh, well, I'm yeah, not going to get that. It. We're trying to identify. Right. We're not trying to embarrass yeah. the best players in the world. We're trying, trying to, to identify, identify them. Right. And, uh, but that really gets to your point about Nicholas. Check this guy up, check this guy off. It's going to play hard for everybody. That's right. So why should I be the last man uh, standing? Uh, Curtis Strange. Great competitor. It, it, Curtis Strange um, had such, it, such great willpower that, um, you know, and, and he felt so strongly about the U.S. Open as his national championship that he, he literally willed a couple wins. Yeah, one of the most moving things I've ever heard in, in probably all of golf is that, you know, Curtis won in 88, won in 89, played well in 90 at Medina, mm -hmm. the one we've been That's talking right. about. And then he said, you know, I was driving to that, uh, I was driving back to my, uh, dropping off my uh, rental car, and I felt it washing out of me. And I mean, I think there's very few quotes that can uh, express how much a mm -hmm. U.S. Open uh, takes out of you. And he was really never the same as a player after that, but what a mark uh, he, he left Absolutely. on the game uh, uh, before that. Uh, two more, Tom Watson. Relentless. You know, Tom early in his career um, had had a few failures here and there on, in majors, and to see him come back in 1982, uh, you know, when Jack Nicklaus was still playing great golf in its Pebble Beach, Jack had won there in uh, 1971 um, or 1972. Um, and to hit that shot on the 71st uh, hole was just miraculous. So Tom, uh, Tom's oftentimes talked about what the U.S. Open has meant to him uh, and meant, you know, he talks about his father's national open championship. So, uh, um, yeah, Tom's a, Tom's a great champion. You know, our listeners may hear the bulldozers behind us. That's because you're building your Jack Nicklaus what are you calling it? Your Jack Nicholas room here? Your Jack Nicholas room here in, in Far Hills at the museum. So let's conclude with uh, word association game, Jack Nicholas. What comes to mind? Greatest U.S. Open player ever. And, and Jack not only won four U.S. Opens, but when you look at the whole body of his U.S. Open work, he had a bad U.S. Open when he finished 15th. Um, like Tiger, I said before, didn't matter what U.S. Open course you put Jack on, he would perform well. Mike, this has been a great pleasure. Thank you Mike, so much for joining it. us. I'm with Mike Davis, the executive director of the USGA here in Far Hills, New Jersey. I'm Michael Bamberger. This has been In Conversation with. Thanks for watching.